Hey everyone, um, I think we'll just wait a few more minutes in case other people are still uh, trickling in at this point in time. Um, I think for the presentation, unless anyone is uh, super interested in seeing my face, I'll just screen share because I have a few video clips and I think that will give you better video quality if it's only the uh, PowerPoint showing up rather than also my personal video. All right, so uh, I think we'll get started. Can everyone see my PowerPoint here and hear me speaking? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, fantastic. Uh, so I decided to do my presentation on uh, pericardial tamponade. I've had a few interesting cases related to this and uh, in speaking with Dr. Pringle, he also had a few cases. So I thought it'd be a, a good topic to discuss uh, some of our kind of important things to know about, but also has some controversial uh, things associated with it, which always makes for a good grand rounds. Um, all right, so the objectives of this presentation are number one, uh, you should always consider pericardial tamponade um, in situations that are appropriate, but also I want you to start thinking about it in more atypical presentations rather than just the classic cases, um, because it doesn't always present in the classic way. Number two, I also want you to be able to identify uh, clinical and uh, focus signs of pericardial tamponade um, and be confident uh, in advocating for your patients based on uh, these signs and also in advocating for them getting uh, the help they need, whether that is just symptomatic management or whether it is definitive treatment. So we'll start off with a case. Um, and uh, this is actually a real case. Um, and this is one that Dr. Pringle had seen. So you're working in the emergency department at uh, LHSC and you see a 67 year old lady uh, who comes in with shortness of breath that's been uh, going on for about four days. And she says it's significantly worse anytime she exerts herself. She's also been feeling generally unwell, uh, more fatigued, less energy than usual and just off from her baseline. Uh, the last few days she said nausea and a few episodes of vomiting. You ask her about if she's having any particular pain, chest pain, um, headache, anything like that. She denies any focal pain, just says she's not feeling well and is feeling short of breath. She has no real significant medical history, uh, maybe a little bit of arthritis, um, but nothing uh, major in terms of her major organ systems, no heart attacks, strokes, anything like that, no major diabetes, heart failure. Um, and uh, she was triaged as a CTAS-3. So you go into the room, you see the patient, um, and uh, the first thing you notice is that she's actually uh, fairly tachycardic with a heart rate of 146. So obviously you're a little bit more interested than, uh, than usual in a patient who's got abnormal vital signs. Respiratory rates, uh, roughly normal, the classic 16. 
Her blood pressure initially 129 over 63. She's setting 95% on room air and uh, her temperature uh, in the ear for what it's worth is 37.4. She doesn't look particularly hypothermic, so it's probably just not the most accurate uh, reading. You also note when you walk through the room that she looks pale. Um, it's uh, fairly obvious. Um, obviously not getting great peripheral circulation. You listen to her hearts um, and for what it's worth, they sound normal. Um, you may or may not look at the GBP uh, and you may or may not see it. Um, nothing particularly obvious was noted in this case uh, on that uh, side of things. You listen to her lungs because she's complaining of shortness of breath and uh, everything sounds relatively normal at this point in time. Her abdomen soft, not particularly tender in any of the quadrants. Um, you then get an ECG and uh, this is the ECG that you receive. Um, I don't know if, uh, can anyone, uh, can everyone see it? Is it a little too small or? Does someone want to uh, take a stab at and tell me what they see on this ECG? Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, essentially what you see is, uh, is tachycardia and uh, low voltage. Um, no obvious signs of uh, kind of ST elevation or depression anywhere. Um, no signs of ischemic heart disease at this point in time. Uh, so because she's kind of going fast, um, oops, sorry, uh, I go back here. Because she's going uh, a little bit fast at this point in time and um, is feeling unwell, uh, possible atrial fibrillation. Um, you think that this might be the cause of her uh, her symptoms. Uh, so uh, they attempted a uh, cardioversion uh, chemically and that was uh, not successful. The patient continued feeling unwell. Um, so at that point in time, you attempt to uh, rate control them with diltiazem, uh, slow them down a little bit, see if that improves. And you order some labs and x-ray uh, to see if there's any other findings that may contribute to the presentation here. This is the uh, the chest x-ray from this patient. So um, basically a little bit of uh, pleural effusion, um, nothing significant though, no big uh, opacities, no big wide mediastinum, no pneumothorax, nothing that would really explain her symptoms very well. You get your labs back and uh, this is your initial set of labs, just a little hyponatremic for what it's worth. Um, her uh, bicarbs uh, a bit low. Uh, her pH is a little bit low, but nothing significant uh, that uh, jumps out at you. Her lactate's high. Um, so that's something to note. Obviously this lady's got something going on. She's tachycardic with an elevated lactate, but uh, her trope's negative. Um, and uh, the remainder of the lab's nothing uh, else that really kind of gives you a slam dunk on what's going on here. So at this point in time, you still keep your differential broad. Um, you start with empiric antibiotics uh, because this obviously could be a case of infection. Um, give her fluids to try to resuscitate her, uh, improve her heart rate. Um, at this point in time, her heart rate does improve. It comes down to 90, uh, respiratory rate's about 20. Uh, her blood pressure's come down a little bit. It's now 100 over 73. And you still can't really figure out exactly what's going on with this lady. Again, a non-specific presentation, elevated lactate, tachycardia, but is fluid responsive. Nothing was uh, obvious on the examination, but uh, you go ahead and order an uh, abdomen uh, CT anyways. Uh, and the report comes back and it shows you that there's a pericardial effusion with IVC reflux, which is kind of a, a CT finding or a finding that can be consistent with pericardial uh, tamponade. So you consult different services, including medicine and cardiology, and you hope that they can come down and provide some guidance uh, moving forward. You also um, uh, managed to do some ultrasounds uh, at the bedside, looking for signs of pericardial tamponade and uh, effusion. So this is uh, the first ultrasound on the left. Um, if everyone, uh, I'll play the video, just make sure that you can see it. I don't know how well it's gonna come across. Can you guys see it there? Yeah, I can see it well. Okay. And uh, does someone want to jump in and say what they see on, on this first video? Maybe someone from the uh, CCFPEM program, one of my uh, colleagues here. 
Um, you see like a, a significant uh, pericardial effusion. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I, I, I can personally see a lot of bowing of that right ventricle um, that we yeah. would classically be looking for, but, but uh, yeah. uh, the PCE is quite significant. Yeah, exactly. So you see a PCE, which you already knew from uh, CAT scan, but it's nice to see it on ultrasound as well. Um, and you get another uh, view here. Um, does someone else want to have a look at this view? Anything, anyone think that this would be considered tamponade based on what they're seeing here? All right, well, we can uh, leave that. We'll come back to it as we wrap up the case, but that's kind of the, the focuses that you see. So that's where we are in terms of this case. Um, oops, there we go. Uh, move forward. Let me get this slide. There we go. So uh, this is uh, what you get a, an interpretation of it, and this is what the interpretation at the time was. Um, so basically, uh, that there's a pericardial effusion. It's moderate size, as Mo pointed out. Um, and there is some uh, right atrial inversion and reduced uh, right ventricular filling. This is with elevated uh, pressures in early tamponade physiology. So nothing uh, extremely severe, um, but definitely not normal at this point in time. Um, so who here has diagnosed tamponade so far? Um, and I guess we can uh, maybe do any of the first to third year residents. Have any of you guys diagnosed it? Yeah, I've seen the case. Okay, and uh, how did you make the diagnosis was it with POCUS? Was it with formal echo? Yeah, it was with POCUS. Okay, and was it more severe or less severe than those findings? How, uh, how, how did yours present? Mine was in the ICU, so more severe for sure. Lots of comorbidities. And uh, the clincher was the IVC, so the plethoric IVC, which I'm sure you'll talk about. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. So, I mean, it's it's a, a rare diagnosis, but not extremely rare. I'm sure everyone will see at least a couple in their career. So, what is the definition of uh, pericardial tamponade? Um, the clinical definition is essentially it's uh, that you have a big effusion or an effusion of some kind around the heart that's uh, causing hemodynamic compromise. Um, due to the compression of uh, the heart itself by the increased pressures within the pericardial sac. And uh, let's see here, this is a formal definition here. It's a life-threatening situation where there's such a large amount of fluid inside the pericardial sac that interferes with the performance of the heart. Uh, and the, the part here about such a large amount of fluid, it really depends also on the rate of accumulation uh, because the key is that it's interfering with the performance of the heart. And if you have something that accumulates very quickly, even with a small amount of fluid, that can still interfere with the performance of the heart. So what are the etiologies of uh, pericardial tamponade? Um, the most, this is kind of in rough order of most common to uh, least common. And this varies depending on the source you look at. But for the most part, idiopathic is the most common, which basically means we don't know why they, uh, they got the pericardial effusion, but it's causing tamponade. Second most common is malignant, so cancer. You'll often see these people come in with uh, pericardial effusions, and sometimes they require pericardial windows because they have recurrent effusions secondary to their malignancy. That's often going to be um, uh, a sanguinous type effusion rather than just a, a serous. Uh, also iatrogenic. Um, if you uh, stick a needle somewhere where it shouldn't be, you can cause uh, a pericardial tamponade, which is obviously not something you want to do, but uh, you should consider it anytime you're putting a needle anywhere close to the heart. Uh, infectious is also another cause. Uh, so infections can obviously result in uh, effusions, and if they become severe enough, they can result in tamponade physiology. Traumatic tamponade is probably the most um, dramatic in presentation, although it's not the most common. Uh, because it usually is the most sudden onset with a very rapid accumulation of fluid, uh, whether this is a trauma or it can also be from uh, an aortic dissection that uh, dissects uh, retrograde and causes uh, blood accumulation around the heart. Hypothyroidism and uremia also uh, causes uh, to consider. So 
when it comes to pericardial tamponade, um, we often kind of are taught about the classic uh, presentation of a rapid accumulation of fluid causing severe uh, hemodynamic collapse um, and possible cardiac arrest. That's uh, the, the classic acute presentation with the classic findings that we'll talk about a little bit more um, in this presentation. But there's also a few other variants of uh, cardiac tamponade that I hadn't really known too much about until I researched for this presentation. The first one is subacute, which is similar in pathophysiology to uh, acute in that it does result in compression of the, uh, the heart and loss of function, but it's much less dramatic and it happens much more gradually. This would often be the case when you have something like uh, a malignancy that gradually accumulates fluid around the heart. It gives you time to distend the pericardium but the pressures do eventually build up to a point where you'll get the classic findings like in elevated uh, JVP, um, the muffled heart sounds, and uh, hypotension. You can also have uh, what's called a low pressure tamponade, which is essentially there's fluid around the heart, um, but the only reason why it's causing physical, physiological uh, derangements is because the pressure within the heart is also low. And often, uh, the way that you can manage this is by increasing the pressures in the heart. So this is someone who uh, can have a, a standard effusion, um, and then if they become hypovolemic for some reason, uh, that decrease in the filling pressures could actually cause the heart's uh, operating pressures to drop below the pressures inside the pericardial sac. Uh, but then if you fill them back up with fluid, uh, then that will raise it above that level again, and you can kind of overcome this tamponade. Whereas with both the acute and the subacute, you often uh, have a much more dramatic finding and uh, the pressures are so high that preload um, and volume resuscitation will not uh, result in improvement of the physiology. And then the final one is regional or uh, localized loculated uh, pericardial tamponade, which is essentially, as it sounds, you can have an area of the pericardial sac that uh, has a loculated effusion um, and that causes focal pressure on one specific region of the heart uh, and that could be anywhere in the heart. This is probably a little bit more difficult to find because you don't necessarily have the classic uh, complete uh, surrounding pericardial effusion. Um, so you'll have to look a little bit more closely and then especially if they have um, an atypical effusion, it may be difficult to identify this with, uh, with a typical focus. It's a more subtle finding. So speaking of uh, kind of the acute and the subacute presentations, this is the, the classical Bex triad uh, that you use to diagnose pericardial tamponade, uh, lower arterial blood pressure, muffled heart sounds, and distended neck veins. I don't know about you guys. I mean, I definitely recognize lower arterial blood pressure, muffled heart sounds potentially, but if you're in a busy ED uh, where there's lots of noise and um, patient screaming, uh, things moving around, other people talking. I think it's kind of sometimes hard to appreciate the muffled heart sounds and those descended neck veins. If they're jumping out at you, you'll notice them. Um, but I think if they're more subtle, I, I don't know that it's the most uh, easily recognized or agreed upon exam finding. I definitely remember my time in internal medicine where you could always uh, use a tangential light and uh, occasionally see the JVP. So what other clinical findings are there to look for in pericardial tamponade? Uh, well, patients often come in with, uh, and I've, and one of the cases I saw was this person came in with a crushing chest pain that sounded to me to be uh, ischemic, but actually turned out to be uh, tamponade. So we often have chest pain um, due to the due to the the tamponade physiology, and their heart compensates by uh, by increasing the rate. Often sinus tachycardia is the most common um, finding you'll see uh, in terms of their heart rate. Uh, on EC, in terms of their uh, their ECG. They'll also often feel short of breath. Um, again, this is just uh, due to the poor perfusion uh, and they'll be tachypnic. Uh, they can generally feel weak and uh, fatigued, again, due to poor cardiac output. Uh, these are all very nonspecific findings, as you can see. The JVP often will be elevated if you can find it um, because as Erfan mentioned, uh, this physiology results in backing up of the pressures uh, into the right side of the heart, which is the lower pressure side. And because it doesn't uh, fill or eject forward properly, this results in uh, backup of the, the circulation into the uh, vena cava and will result in elevated JVP. Um, also, because it's not filling and pumping properly, you don't have very good forward flow, which results in the hypotension, uh, one of the classic findings um, for a pericardial tamponade. The narrow pulse pressure, um, is, uh, is also kind of a, a classic finding. Um, do any of the residents know why uh, you get a narrow pulse pressure um, with pericardial tamponade? 
and pulses paradoxes. I could talk about pulses paradoxes. Sure. My understanding, as you breathe in, you get that uh, lower pressure system, you get an influx of fluid. Typically, in a non-strained heart, your body is able to um, your body is able to adjust to that, and you get just basically normal fluid flow. But in a tamponaded heart, as the influx of fluid comes into the right ventricle, it will bow the septum and compress on the left ventricle and drop your cardiac output from for that reason. So you get that uh, change in systolic blood pressure with each in which each breath that you take. Yeah, exactly. That's correct. Uh, sorry, so I should have clicked that side first. So everyone just answered that. Um, and as you said, it's uh, because you have increased filling of the right heart um, and there's a, a confined space in the pericardium. Uh, it means that the septum has nowhere to go um, because the right heart can't bulge out. It causes it to bulge into the left, which means that when you take a deep breath in and you increase your right sided filling, your left sided output decreases. So therefore, pulses paradoxes, you'll drop beats um, on palpation during inspiration. And that's why it's... Uh, and, and that's exactly what causes that clinical finding. So uh, here's an example of kind of uh, the, uh, it's kind of a little bit um, more difficult to see on this screen, but uh, the classic ECG findings, uh, you're gonna have the S1, uh, Q3 and T3. Uh, I think it's not very visible on here, um, but uh, those are often uh, not common. The most common finding that you'll see on ECG is just a sinus tachycardia. So once you've done your clinical examination uh, and you've done your physical exam, done ECG, what, guy, what would you guys do next uh, in the evaluation of this? I'll ask again a CCFP uh, resident, what would, you, what would your next steps be? You have someone you suspect uh, they might have a tamponade because of their physical exam and history. Uh, do a point of care ultrasound. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so this is kind of going to be the thing that will allow you to clinch your diagnosis. Um, obviously, the first thing you need to look for on point of care ultrasound is a pericardial effusion. Uh, without an effusion, uh, they really can't have tamponade unless it's that very esoteric uh, regional tamponade, then you miss that regional aspect of the effusion. You can use essentially any of your views. The most common ones will be your sub xiphoid to look for whether there's an effusion present or not. Uh, you can also use the parasternal for that. Parasternal will also get you a, a good look at uh, the, the right ventricle. Um, and then the apical will get you a good look at all the, uh, the chambers um, and their proportionate sizes. So pericardial effusion is necessary, but not sufficient for the diagnosis of tamponade. As I said, if you don't have an effusion, you can't really have elevated pressures. Uh, you can get similar physiological derangements from things like restrictive pericarditis, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this, uh, this talk. Um, and the effusion itself results in some of the physical findings uh, that we just talked about. So the muffled heart sounds is because you're listening through the fluid um, in the pericardial sac, which kind of uh, makes the sound more muffled. Um, and it will also result in uh, the decreased electrical voltage again, because the current has further to travel, it attenuates the voltage. Um, and the swinging of the heart, as you can see within the effusion, will result in the, the finding of electrical alternance. Uh, so when we have pericardial effusions, you can kind of um, group them into gross uh, volume amounts. I wouldn't bother doing uh, a quantitative assessment, but you can give a qualitative assessment. So a trivial, um, this is very small, less than 50 milliliters. Um, and as it says here, it's usually only seen um, in systole when the heart contracts, it's not gonna be this big uh, effusion around it. Um, and you may, I guess, uh, depending on the situation, have a small amount of physiological um, fluid. Small effusion, uh, 50 to 100 mils. Um, and uh, you'll, this is when you'll start seeing it throughout the cardiac cycle. So both systole and diastole, you'll see the effusion. Um, if it's surrounding the entire heart, you can classify that as moderate. Um, and uh, if it just looks very impressive, uh, a large with greater than 500 milliliters, it'll, it'll jump out on you on the screen and you won't really be able to miss it, kind of like this, uh, this one here that we were just looking at. So the important thing to know too, um, 
about the pericardial effusion is that obviously not all effusions result in tamponade. Why is that? And this uh, this uh, physiological graph kind of demonstrates that to you. Um, depends on how rapidly the effusion accumulates. So if you have a rapid accumulation, um, as you increase the volume very quickly, your pressure will shoot up very quickly as well because the, the pericardium is not very distensible and therefore um, uh, as you put a small amount of volume in, the pressure increases rapidly. However, if you have a more gradual thing, again, um, like a malignancy wave gradual accumulation, that allows um, time for the pericardium to stretch, and therefore you can get to much larger volumes before you uh, you result in significantly elevated uh, intrapericardial uh, pressures. And those pressures are what result in the tamponade physiology. So it's very difficult, again, to know whether the tamponade just by the size of the fusion, um, unless it's exceptionally small, um, then in which case it's extremely unlikely that there would be a tamponade. Um, as Erfan properly mentioned, uh, aptly pointed out, um, a plethoric IVC, um, which is the sonographic equivalent of uh, distended neck veins and an elevated JVP, is your most sensitive um, finding for, uh, for pericardial uh, tamponade. Because as the pressure builds up, the first thing that you'll do is you'll start backing up the pressure into your right-sided system, which fills your uh, right atrium and right ventricle. Um, and because of that, you also note a decreased respiratory variation uh, in the uh, the IVC. I don't know about you guys, but I'm much more comfortable making a call on a plethoric IVC than I am looking for um, uh, whatever level the JVP is at. And there's been enough studies that we say that we can know that this is roughly correlated to the, the JVP um, measurements clinically. So that's what I would uh, do as my first assessment. If their IVC is not uh, significantly distended um, or if it's uh, greatly collapsible, then essentially with a decent amount of certainty, you can say that there is not gonna be pericardial tamponade even if there is a pericardial effusion. So the next finding that we uh, look for on POCUS is uh, the right atrial systolic collapse. Um, it's usually the first kind of more definitive sign of uh, tamponade. The plethoric IVC can be due to a number of reasons, but this is a little bit more of a finding that's restricted to tamponade. Um, and what occurs here is essentially this, this sign um, develops when the pressure in the pericardium exceeds the right atrial filling pressure. And therefore, when you should be filling the right atrium, you have collapse of the right atrium instead. Um, and that's the, uh, the pericardial fluid exerting its pressure and collapsing the right atrium rather than the fluid from the, uh, the, the vena cava's uh, coming in to fill it. Um, an important thing to note is that this is right atrial systolic collapse, but it's systole of the ventricles, not of the atria. Um, and this is because the right atrial pressure is lowest during ventricular systole um, after the atria have emptied into the ventricles um, and the atria start refilling. Um, a good way to, to identify this, because it's not always obvious, is to look for collapse of the right atrium with the mitral valve and tricuspid valve um, being closed. Oops. Uh, I don't know if you guys can appreciate that on this uh, image or not. Again, um, Zoom doesn't always have the best video quality, but you see that this wall starts bowing in. And when you're looking and seeing it's bowing in, you're also seeing that the, the, uh, the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve are closed at the same time. And that allows you to confirm that it coincides with uh, systole rather than diastole. And the important point here is to not confuse this with right atrial contraction, uh, which is physiologic and can easily be confused with uh, systolic collapse if you're not uh, careful to look at what cycle of, uh, what, what, which um, part of the cardiac cycle you're in. Uh, so the reason why people confuse this is because unless you have a pericardial fusion, you often won't be able to appreciate the right atrial contraction on standard POCUS views just because um, we're often focused on the ventricles um, and uh, our, our views are optimized for that. But once you have an effusion that allows you to better visualize the entire heart uh, because fluid is a good sonographic window and therefore you can start seeing um, this uh, contraction of the, of the atria, which may confuse you. Um, so this video kind of shows an example of atrial contraction. You can see there that it does look like uh, it does look like the, uh, the, the the collapse in the previous video, but the important point to note is that when this is contracting, you can see that the uh, the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve are opening, 
Um, does everyone appreciate that on this video that the, the contraction occurs with open valves and on the previous video it was with the closed valves when we had collapse? I don't know. I'll just give it a little more time. All right, so there I kind of scrolled through it. Hopefully you guys can see it. If not, I'm sure you can find the vi more videos online or I can send you these videos afterwards. So the next uh, finding that you'd want to look for is uh, right ventricular diastolic collapse. And as opposed to the atria, the, the, uh, the ventricles um, are usually filling during diastole. That's when they're at the lowest pressure. And that's when you'll see the collapse start uh, with uh, the elevated levels, uh, elevated pressures in the pericardium. And again, this is when the pericardial pressure exceeds the, uh, the filling pressure of the ventricles. Uh, um, again, uh, in looking to confirm which part of the cycle this is and not confuse it with, uh, uh, with ventricular uh, systole, you want to make sure that this collapse is occurring uh, when the mitral and tricuspid valves are open. So you can appreciate that in this video on the right ventricle up at the top that uh, you see that the wall collapses inward when the mitral valve is open. And that's not what should occur in normal, uh, normal con uh, cardiac uh, function. You should see that as the mitral valve opens, uh, both ventricles should fill. Uh, the other finding, and this is a little bit more of an advanced technique to look for, um, but uh, definitely not, with, not outside the realm of possibility if you're interested and keen on POCUS, uh, is looking for respiratory flow variation. And what you're looking at is essentially you need to get a, a view of the heart, most often the apical view, and then you can put um, a Doppler, um, a Doppler window right over the either the mitral valve or the, the tricuspid valve, and you're looking um, to see the fluid flow uh, across those valves. Uh, between different cardiac cycles and you're looking to see whether there's any change in the amount of fluid flow between the cycles. Uh, and the way you do that is by um, looking at the velocity because the flow is proportional to the velocity. You don't need to actually calculate the actual um, flow. You just need to know that uh, uh, if it's directly proportional to the velocity and the velocity changes by 25%, then you have a significant uh, change in your respiratory flow. Um, and what you'll see here, as we had talked about with the physiology, is that when uh, you have tamponade physiology, your right ventricle will actually um, result in that increased flow across the right ventricle when you have inspiration um, and you're going to have decreased uh, left ventricular uh, outflow when you have inspiration again because the septum will bulge because of the contract the, the limited space in the pericardium the septum will bulge towards the left side and uh, therefore increase your right ventricular flow while decreasing your left and this is uh, essentially the sonographic equivalent to pulses paradoxes as we discussed it's the same physiology it's just a question of whether you're feeling for the pulses on physical examination uh, or looking for the change in uh, in blood flow on um, on POCUS. The important thing to know is that uh, whether it's the left or it's the tricuspid or the mitral, 25% variation is significant. It's just that on the mitral side, you would expect to see uh, the flow decrease during inspiration, and on the uh, on the uh, the tricuspid side, you'd expect to see it decrease during expiration. So to kind of summarize the diagnostic criteria that we're looking at for pericardial effusion um, and tamponade, uh, the clinical uh, features are what you notice first. Uh, so hypotension, distended neck, neck veins, um, and the muffled heart sounds. On ECG, you'll see sinus tachycardia, low voltage, and you can see electrical alternance, which is well illustrated in this, uh, this uh, ECG here, uh, which is a change in the QRS amplitude. Um, uh, in a regular manner across the uh, the rhythm strip. And you can also see the POCUS uh, triad, uh, which is pericardial uh, diastolic collapse and a dilated IVC. So that's all well and good, but I mean, the fundamental takeaway point from diagnosis here is that if you have an unwell or hypotensive patient who has a pericardial fusion and who has a plethoric IVC, you should essentially assume it's tamponade until proven otherwise, because some of these more advanced findings are, are less common and uh, less easily uh, recognized, especially if you're not uh, extremely proficient with POCUS. Um, so what do you do when someone has a pericardial uh, tamponade? Well, like anything in emergency medicine, you usually start with uh, supportive care. Um, that can include IV fluids to increase the preload. And if you're in something like a, uh, a low pressure tamponade, that could actually essentially 
uh, reverse the physiology for the time being um, and improve the patient's condition. Um, you then obviously consult cardiology and CCU, um, uh, depending on which center you're in, and you consider a pericardiosynthesis. Um, so has anyone done a pericardiosynthesis? Anyone? On CCU, anything? No? Sorry, say that again? Seen a few, but haven't done it. Okay. Well, uh, when I was on CCU in Windsor, I got the opportunity to do one. And um, I can tell you, uh, the cardiologist confirmed this. He's done a bunch. No matter how many you do, this is uh, an intimidating procedure uh, because you're essentially taking a large needle and going uh, right at a person's chest. The person's usually awake and looking at you too. Uh, and depending on which... Um, which uh, approach you take, they're often sitting up. So you're, you're coming at a person with a large, long needle while they're awake and they're already in distress. Um, and obviously uh, we do a lot of uh, different procedures with needles, but uh, often not ones where we're right next to a large uh, beating organ um, that is potentially a few centimeters away and puncturing it could be uh, catastrophic. So the classic teaching for pericardiosynthesis is a sub foot approach. Uh, this is one that you would consider doing blindly in a code situation um, if you, or, or ultrasound guided in a code situation if you uh, were convinced that uh, tamponade was the result of the code. And essentially, you start in the sub xiphoid region um, and you point up the needle towards the patient's left uh, posterior shoulder. Uh, you apply back pressure and you advance the needle until you uh, withdraw blood. Um, and then you can either put a guide wire in uh, and uh, put a catheter through, or you can just directly uh, drain the fluid. Um, with the uh, with the needle itself. Um, the risks associated with this is you're going uh, right near the liver. You could lacerate the liver and uh, cause hemorrhage, um, which is obviously never good. Um, the benefits are that it's uh, relatively reproducibly where fluid will often be. And that means that uh, if it's blind um, or you don't have great ultrasound guidance, uh, this is your best shot of uh, of hitting things. I guess the other advantage is the, the structure right next to this will likely be the right ventricle. So if you do uh, damage it, it's a lower pressure system than the left ventricle. Uh, another option is actually you can go parasternal or apical. Um, both of these you definitely want to do under ultrasound guidance. And essentially what you want to do is identify the biggest pocket of fluid. Um, it seems more intimidating um, because it's not the classic approach, but uh, the cardiologist I was working with um, suggested that we do the apical approach because this is where the most fluid was. And he actually finds it to be the easiest approach. In either case, as I said, you look for fluid with your ultrasound probe, either in the parasternal view or in the apical view, you find your deepest pocket, you uh, line up your needle, and uh, again, you apply back pressure uh, and slowly insert it until you uh, get uh, fluid withdrawal. Um, and then you can, again, either put a uh, catheter in or drain the fluid. We went with the apical approach um, and uh, even watching the needle uh, go through the pericardium and not go into the uh, myocardium when you see uh, kind of serosanguinous fluid come back uh, it is kind of a an intimidating thing but uh, you can then put a guide wire in. you can confirm that the guide wire is within the pericardial space and not in one of the ventricles with ultrasound before you dilate and put your catheter in and that's what we ended up doing the important thing to note about the uh, uh, the apical view the apical approach is generally relatively safe. There's not too many um, structures other than the heart itself to be worried about uh, down there. Uh, you, you do worry about uh, hitting the, um, the mammary arteries. And again, you want to, when you're using the parasternal or the apical, you want to kind of do the same technique with a chest tube. You want to go just above the rib to avoid the neurovascular bundle on the underside of the rib. With the parasternal, the other thing to consider is that uh, there is the left anterior descending uh, artery there. So uh, there's a risk that instead of just uh, puncturing into the heart itself, you could essentially uh, dissect or damage uh, the LED, which would uh, cause an iatrogenic myocardial uh, infarction. You want to be careful of that, obviously. So uh, circling back to the case that we started with, um, the 67-year-old lady with a large pericardial effusion and likely obstructive shock, probably cardiac tamponade. Uh, CCU was called for this lady um, 
uh, they did an echo and we they were Dr. Pringle advocated for a pericardial synthesis uh, when the echo is uh, demonstrative of car uh, cardiac tamponade. However, um, fortunately or unfortunately, this lady had improved with fluids and that's something that's not uncommon with tamponade. Again, it's all about pressure differentials. And if you get the pressure high enough in the heart, it can overcome temporarily the pressure in the pericardial space and therefore reverse some of the physiology. So this lady, by the time CCU arrived, uh, had been resuscitated and her systolic blood pressure was now 100, her heart rate was 90. So um, CCU looked at the patient and said, oh, well, she's, uh, she's doing well. Um, she's improved, we don't need to go and do this big scary procedure of sticking a needle in her chest right away. Uh, so uh, they, they decided to bring her up to the CCU and monitor her. Um, she had also been feeling better, she was admitted to the CCU um, and uh, the procedure was delayed. Unfortunately, that night that she was admitted, uh, overnight she decompensated well on the CCU um, and uh, they frantically attempted to uh, conduct a pericardial synthesis. But at that point in time, uh, unfortunately, it was, uh, it was too late. It was unsuccessful on the patient uh, coded and passed away. So that's the, the case there. And that's um, uh, obviously, it, it's, it's always uh, sad when a patient passes away, but it's also extremely sad when we see that the diagnosis was made. Um, Dr. Pringle had correctly advocated for uh, what needed to be done, but um, for one reason or another, the procedure was delayed um, and had it been conducted, this patient very well may have survived. So the key points to consider from this talk um, are that uh, you should consider pericardial tamponade in atypical presentations. Um, patients don't always present with the classic clinical findings. Um, they may improve with fluids. It doesn't mean that it wasn't tamponade to start with. It just means that you may have temporarily overcome the physiology, uh, but often they will continue to deteriorate and therefore that should just be a bridge to getting your definitive management rather than as a way to avoid doing a procedure that you don't want to be done. Sorry, that you don't want to do. Uh, look, so always look for the clinical ECG and POCUS findings. Um, again, clinically hypotensive, uh, the other ones uh, plus or minus uh, descended neck veins and uh, muffled heart sounds. ECG is going to be usually sinus tachycardia. Obviously, it could be something like atrial fibrillation. Uh, electrical alternators is possible. S1, Q3, T3 is also possible. Focus findings: um, if there is no, if the IVC is not plethoric um, or uh, and is collapsing, um, then the likelihood of pericardial tamponade is is very low. If your IVC is distended, however, uh, then you want to look very closely for the other findings, uh, right atrial uh, systolic collapse, right ventricular diastolic collapse, um, and the uh, the respiratory flow variation. However, even if you don't find any of those other findings with the pericardial effusion and, uh, and a large IVC, you really should be keeping this on your uh, differential. And the reason for that is because there's a spectrum between pericardial fusion and tamponade. Um, obviously, as the pressure increases, you have more tamponade physiology, and as the pressure differential, uh, sorry, and as the pressure decreases, you'll have less uh, physiology. But that doesn't mean that it's a. There's no clear-cut line that defines that divides one from the other. You'll see some of these uh, findings present and uh, others not, um, but it's always important to keep them all on your differential. And as uh, as I mentioned previously, you want to advocate for your patients to get the treatment that they needed. The thing is, um, cardiology, for the most part, they do things like caths, echoes. Pericardial synthesis is, is not a common procedure for them, so it may not be something that they're extremely comfortable with. As I said, the cardiologist I work with in Windsor has been working for many years, but he said he hadn't done a huge number of them, and every time that he does, he's still nervous to do it. So as an eMERGE physician, I'm sure that we'll be hesitant to do this procedure um, just because it's an intimidating procedure, and cardiologists are the same way, but it is important to advocate for your patient to make sure that we don't avoid a procedure just because we're afraid to do it. Uh, so here's the references. Does anyone have any questions, discussions about these key points, any cases that they want to talk about? Hi, Mason. Uh, Danielle, I'm one of the PGY4s. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned, can you just go back to the ECG findings you expect to see for tamponade? So I think you mentioned uh, yeah. that I wasn't sort of familiar with. Oh, the, uh, uh, are, you, are you talking about? Um, I think you said something about S1, Q3, T3. 
which I think more of a uh, right heart strain pattern. And I guess I'm not clear on why you'd be seeing that in Tampanad. Oh, shoot, sorry. Yeah, you're, you're right. That was my mistake. I, I'm doing two presentations and I, that was my mistake. I, I mix them up. You're right. That's not a finding in uh, Tampanad. It is the low, it is the sinus tachycardia, the low voltage and the electric alternands. I oh, just sorry. literally, I'm doing a grand rounds tomorrow for ICU and I'm doing PE. So I oh, crossed yeah. them in my mind. Sorry about that. Yep, no, no, no worries. That. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, Mason is Derek here. Um, good job on the rounds. Um, I just wanted to make the point that I've had a number of uh, tamponade cases through the years, and to me, they've all been handled very disappointingly. Uh, I had a young lady come in, or relatively young lady, at 42, screaming with chest pain at two in the morning, hypotensive tachycardic. Um, you know, called the fellow down. He agreed. Uh, I came to the CCU the next day to see how she was doing and they put in a central line and gave her inotropes and fluids for, they thought it was from diarrhea. Uh, I kind of uh, made my point strongly to the cardiologist and uh, they later drained her. In speaking with a couple of cardiology guys I know and I'm friendly with, I, I, I agree with you that he, they say that, you know, even the cardiologists here at a teaching center are, don't do very much pericardiosynthesis, and many of them are very uncomfortable with it. And uh, in the case you presented, uh, almost certainly that's why she died. You made the presentation look a little bit nicer, but when you look through that chart, the, the basically the CC resident, fellow, ICU were all panicking, multiple calls to the consultant, and the consultant just basically refused to come in, and this lady died. Um, so I certainly think it's a procedure that Emerge docs should not be doing unless they are the patients basically dying in front of them. They have no other backup. Uh, there was a recent guideline, or fairly recent guideline, from the European Heart Society uh, in 2014, basically saying that, emphasizing that this should be really emphasized in cardiology training, and you shouldn't really do any unless you've done at least five supervised ones. So, in no case will that be emerge docs. So, I wouldn't be running around with my needle sticking in people's chests very often. All right, I mean, I guess if there's no other discussion, um, that's the end of the presentation. So I've got my uh, references there that we used. Um, so yeah, uh, just uh, consider the diagnosis. And as Dr. Pringle said, I, I, yeah, I agree. I wouldn't be uh, doing it myself uh, uh, unless there's absolutely no other option, but uh, you definitely should advocate for the patient to try to get it done um, and, and push the cardiology uh, to do the procedure that is, that is, uh, that is necessary to help the patient. Thank you all very much.